So what I'm going to talk about is Gaze recommendations for teaching introductory statistics. And I'll spell out what Gaze means on the very next slide here. Gaze stands for Guidelines for Assessment and Instruction in Statistics Education. And there will be a quiz at the end in which I ask you what the acronym stands for. Not really, but as potential faculty members, it's fairly important to get comfortable with acronyms. That's a big part of the job, so that's what GAE stands for. These are recommendations for teaching introductory statistics at the college level. There's also a GAE report and GAE recommendations for teaching statistics at the pre-K through 12 levels. These were developed by the American Statistical Association. The GAE uh, college report originally in 2005 and then revised in 2016. And there's the, there's the URL to, to read all about gaze. And I'll give you some of the highlights in the next half hour or so here. Gaze consists of six recommendations for teaching introductory statistics. And here they are. And the format of my presentation is I'll go through all six of these, and I'll have two or three examples that try to illustrate each one. And I also have what I call some interludes spaced throughout the presentation here. Recommendation one is teach statistical thinking. Maybe you're thinking, well, of course, that goes without saying. When you teach introductory statistics, you teach statistical thinking. But I don't think it's all that easy to do, to be honest. I don't think it's all that easy to define statistical thinking. I'm going to give you some examples of what I think constitutes statistical thinking in a couple of minutes here. And it's frankly, it's a lot easier to, to teach mechanics and things that don't involve statistical thinking. But even though number one is probably obvious, it's a non-trivial thing to, to teach well and to help students learn how to do. Recommendation two, focus on conceptual understanding. Three, integrate real data with a context and a purpose. Four, foster active learning. Five, use technology not just to analyze data, but also to explore concepts. And six, use assessments not just to evaluate student learning, which everyone does, but also ideally to improve student learning. So as I say, the format of what I've prepared here is to go through these six recommendations with a couple of examples for each. So let's start with teach statistical thinking. And as I already mentioned, I think it's hard to define statistical thinking. I suppose I could give you a textbook definition if I wanted to, but I don't know if it would be all that insightful or helpful. So instead, what I want to do is give you two examples that I think illustrate statistical thinking. And they're both fairly, fairly uh, well-known examples, and they're both kind of old. That's one thing I don't like about the examples here. This one's from the 1970s. These are data from UC Berkeley in the 1970s, looking at two of their largest graduate programs, looking at the number who were accepted into the program out of the applicants and the number who were denied admission and classifying men and women. So I often present this on the first day of class in an introductory statistics class and say, what do we do here? How do we see if there's an issue with potential sex discrimination? And hopefully a student will say, well, we need to look at percentages. We can't just compare 533 and 113 because we got a lot more men than women who applied. So if this were an actual class, if you were my actual students, I'd ask you to get out your calculators or your phones and calculate these proportions. But let's just, I'll show them to you here. Okay. Oh. In a moment. There we go. So about 45% of the men were accepted, about 25% of the women were accepted. That seemed like a big difference here. It sure seems like a big difference. What's going on? Do we have evidence of discrimination against women? And we could talk about how these are observational data, and so we'd have to be careful about drawing any causal conclusions in the first place. Where I want to go is I want to dig a little bit deeper. The next I tell students, Graduate admission decisions are not made at the university level, they're made at the program level. And I mentioned these are two programs at Berkeley that these data come from. So let me now show you the data program by program. We'll call them program A and program F. It's the same data as the previous slide. We've got 533 men accepted, 665 men denied. I'm not cheating with the numbers or anything. I'm just breaking it down by program. Again, if you were my students in a class, I'd ask you, what do we do now? Hopefully someone would say, well, let's do the same proportions, but program by program. Well, let me save you the bother. Program A, there's the proportions who were accepted. Program F, there's the proportions who were accepted. So there's something weird going on here. 
If you remember, altogether, there was a much higher acceptance rate for men than women. Within each program, while A accepts a much higher percentage of women, F accepts a slightly higher percentage of women. The students are quick to say, something's weird here. Women do better by admission rate in each program, but worse when you combine the program. And you probably recognize this as an example of Simpson's paradox, but intro students don't know that yet. So the big question is, explain what's going on. How do you explain this oddity? And that's non-trivial for students, but many of them can get there, perhaps with a little bit of a nudge. And the explanation I'm looking for is, there's two big differences between program A and program F. One is program A is easy to get in, better than 50% acceptance rate for each. Program F is really hard to get in, less than 10% acceptance rate. Why does that matter? Because A, most of the men apply to A. If you look at A, it's 800 and some men, 100 and some women. Most of the women applied to F. Three times as many women applied to F as A. Less than half as many men applied to F as A. So boiling all that down to one sentence, men apply in big numbers to the easy program to get in. Women mostly apply to the hard program to get in. So I think this is an example of statistical thinking. We're thinking about additional information, additional variables, trying to explain the relationship we saw between gender and admission rate and looking at it program by program. And notice the math we're using is, is trivial. We calculated proportions. There's nothing complicated about the math, and yet there's some fairly sophisticated thinking going on there. Second example, another old example, but a well-known example, the 1970 draft lottery. If you're not familiar with this, in 1970, the U.S. decided they needed to draft young men into the armed forces. And of course, that's a big, 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 big deal. So you want to do it as fairly as possible. And they had what I think was a really good idea. They based the draft on birthdays. Every birthday of the year was assigned a draft number. If you were born on the day that got draft number one, you were in the very first group to be drafted. What are we looking at here? We're looking at a graph of draft number versus day number. Day number just means January 1 is 1, January 2 is 2, and so on throughout the year. So I asked students, do you see any reason to doubt that this was a fair random lottery? And pretty much everyone says that sure looks like random scatter. There's no reason to doubt random. Once again, I say, let's dig a little deeper. And I give them a table with all the draft numbers. And I say, find the median draft number for your birth month. And then across the room, we share the results and we look at all the median. Let me show you this same graph with the medians superimposed. What do you think now? Is there any reason to doubt randomness? Now, again, there's something fishy going on here. Every single median in the second half of the year is smaller than every single median in the first half of the year. That's pretty weird. Could that have happened by random chance? Sure, it could have, but how likely is it? Well, let's go to the next slide. What I've done here is look at the correlation coefficient between graph number and day number. It's negative 0.226. What I've done on the right is, this is from simulating 10,000 repetitions of a fair random lottery process and calculating the correlation each time. And you'll notice we never got a correlation as big as negative 0.226 in 10,000 repetitions of a truly random lottery. The bottom line, there's very, very, very strong evidence that something fishy was going on in the 1970 draft lottery. It's a very interesting case study. If you want to read about it, you can Google and read all about it. The basic explanation is they didn't mix the birthdays very well. The birthdays were essentially in capsules like ping pong balls. They thought they mixed them up and pulled them out one at a time, but they didn't mix them up very well. So again, I think this illustrates statistical thinking. By looking at those summary statistics, nothing more complicated than medians, we're able to see a bit of a signal amidst all of that noise. And then by using simulation, we can investigate random chance as an explanation and pretty much rule out random chance as an explanation. So these two examples involve proportional reasoning, thinking about alternative explanations, using summary statistics, investigating random chances and explanations. And I think there's fairly sophisticated statistical thinking going on there, a very, very, very uncomplicated mathematics. And I present these examples often on the first day of a statistical literacy class.
that's recommendation one, teach statistical thinking. First interlude, I almost went to recommendation two. I thought I forgot this first interlude was here. First interlude is showing you survey results of math and statistics departments around the US, looking at the number of students taught, in mostly introductory statistics courses in the fall term of these four different years. And what do you see? There's huge growth over this 15 year period. In four-year college math departments, the number of students taking introductory statistics almost doubled. The statistics department almost doubled. In two-year colleges, almost quadrupled in this 15-year period. And I'd be willing to bet a lot that the numbers are going to be considerably higher in fall of 2020 than they were in 2015. We can also see that most introductory statistics at college and university level is not taught in statistics departments. Less than 20% of intro stat students are taught in statistics. Recommendation two, back to gaze, is focus on conceptual understanding. And I have two examples here dealing with very, very elementary descriptive statistics. First example is about averages. Here's a, a question I'd like to ask my students. When I moved from Pennsylvania to California, I'm pretty sure the average IQ dropped in both states. You have to wait if you use this example for all the uproarious laughter to die down. It's a good thing we're on mute, or I'm sure I'd be overwhelmed by all the laughter. What's the point here? I ask students, is this possible? And if so, what would have to be true? But I think this gets at whether they understand how averages work. I'm not calculating an average of 10 numbers or anything. But most students can say, well, yeah, in principle, I guess that could happen as long as I was. But uh, if my IQ was above average in Pennsylvania, when I left, the average IQ dropped. And they'd have no trouble believing my average IQ is, my IQ, sorry, is below average in California. But when I entered, the average IQ dropped. Nothing profound there, but I think it gets at, do you understand how averages work, not just how to calculate? Second example deals with variability and with uh, standard deviation. So consider two people who record ages of customers. Abby is at the on-campus snack bar. Mary's at the McDonald's near the freeway. The question is simply, who's going to have the larger standard deviation of customer ages, Abby or Mary? There's nothing to calculate here. Students just need to realize that standard deviation is a measure of variability. And on campus, the ages of customers are going to be a lot less spread out than, than at the McDonald's where they have infants and senior citizens and everyone in between. That was recommendation two. We're going to go through them pretty quickly here. Recommendation three is integrate real data with a context and a purpose. And certainly there's lots and lots and lots of real data you can find from, from either available sources or genuine research studies. I'm going to give two examples of data I collect on my own students that nonetheless deal with real research questions. The first one is about the psychological phenomena known as anchoring. So this is, I'll give, I'll give away part of the answer I'm looking for here. This is a randomized experiment I do with students, but I don't tell them that in advance. What I do with them is I give them a strip of paper, and on that strip of paper are two questions. Unbeknownst to them, there's two versions of the questions. Group one gets this version. I know about Nelson Mandela. Hopefully they know who Mandela was, but in case they don't, there's a one sentence description. The first question there, of course, is ridiculous. Of course, he was older than 16 years old when he died. And then I asked students, make a guess for how old he was. Roughly half the students get that version. The other half get this version. You have to read pretty carefully to see the difference. There's only one character difference. Instead of asking about age 16, I'm asking about age 160, which is equally ridiculous. Of course, he was younger than 160. Why bother to ask? Well, the point here is we're gathering data to investigate the psychological phenomenon of anchoring. Anchoring suggests that seeing that number, 16 versus 160, even though it's irrelevant to your thought process, you presumably dismiss the number immediately. The phenomenon says that's going to influence what you'd guess for how old he was when he died. The conjecture is that the students who see the number 16 will generally guess smaller ages than students who see the number 160. Let me show you some data from our recent class of mine. 
And sure enough, there's a statistically significant difference there. The T statistic is bigger than four in absolute value. So there is pretty strong evidence for the anchoring phenomenon. What's my point? My point is you can collect data from students in class. That's real data on a real research phenomenon that only takes five minutes or so of class time. You can talk about issues of experiment versus observational study, as well as analyze the data. Afterwards. Here's a second example. And I am gonna ask you to answer the question I'm about to ask here with your uh, indulgence, we'll collect some data on you. This is also from a real research study from 2007 about a phenomenon called facial prototyping. The idea is when, when you see someone's face, you get an idea for the name. When you hear someone's name, you get a mental image for the face. Is there, is there a connection between faces and names and people's thinking? There's two faces. Let me tell you, one of them is Bob, one of them's Tim. Who do you think is on the left? So I think I'm, Mina, do you want to launch the poll or I think I can too? I'm happy to start it. I think I can, I think I just did. Okay, yeah, you did, yeah. Please vote, who's on the left? I'm just gonna give you another few seconds to vote. Get your vote in. I get to see the results in real time here. I assume you're not seeing the results yet. Five more seconds. You've even got a timer, I can see. I'll give you four more seconds, then it'll be 30 seconds. All right, thank you. I'm going to end the polling and show you the results. And this is pretty typical of what I see in class. It's about 70% putting Tim on the left. Well, the researchers had in mind that Tim was the face on the left. In fact, the way that this was done was they asked people to describe what do you think a Tim looks like? What do you think a Bob looks like? And these are the drawings that professional artists drew based on people's descriptions. And sure enough, it's Tim on the left. So what can we do with this? Well, we can, we can use this to introduce the idea of hypothesis testing and statistical significance and p-value. I'll get back to that in a couple of minutes. But again, it's a, it's a real phenomenon, facial prototyping. You can gather data from students in just five minutes of class. Recommendation four, foster active learning. There's lots and lots and lots of ways foster active learning can be fostered and implemented. Let me just give you, I think, two examples here also. I've been using this example pretty much for my 30 year teaching career. These are real data on the life expectancy of a country and the number of televisions per thousand people in the country. This is a bit old now, but there's some real data on countries of the world. What do I ask students? Well, is there an association there? Clearly, yes, there's a positive, moderately strong association. The big question is, can we infer causation? Does this mean that sending TVs to the countries down here would cause their citizens to live longer? Of course, that's ridiculous, and students know that's ridiculous. The point here is students can tell me that association does not infer causation. I don't need to tell them. They can tell me if I ask questions that point them in the right direction. A harder question for them is this one. We still make predictions about life expectancy based on TVs per thousand people in the country. The answer I try to lead them toward there is, well, well, yes. I'm trying to predict life expectancy of a country. It's worthwhile to know the number of TVs per thousand, even if it's not a cause and effect relation. Another example of fostering active learning, Beth and I have used this example for a long, long time now. We give students a copy of the Gettysburg Address, 268 words in the version that we use. We ask them to take a sample of 10 words. And they usually stare at me, sort of wondering, what do I do? I say, just circle 10 words. You've got the page in front of you, circle 10 words. At this point, I haven't told them what we're gonna analyze about the data. And then eventually I tell them we're going to look at the lengths of the words, the number of letters per word. And I ask them to calculate the average length of a word in their sample. And then back when we, when we had actual classrooms and people gathered together in the same room, they'd come up to the front of the room and put a dot on the dot plot for the average length of their sample. There's some results for a class of mine a while ago. And the big picture question is, is this a reasonable sampling method? 
and I, I want them to tell me, well, we need to know what the population average is. They probably wouldn't use that term, but what's the average length in the whole speech? The average length in the whole speech is 4.295, and about 80 to 90% of students produce a sample average bigger than that. And so, of course, the point here is we're illustrating sampling bias. And the hope is they understand sampling bias better because they put one of the dots on the board. And if they're in one of the, most likely they put a dot that was bigger than the population average of 4.295. We talk about why people tend to pick bigger words than average. And this, this is probably a 30 minute activity that introduces the idea of sampling bias. I'm quick to tell them sampling bias is a property of the method. And so whose idea was the method? And they say, well, it was my idea. So I say, this is on me, it's not on you. Sampling bias is a property of the method. The method was my idea. Circle 10 words was a bad method. So I say, give me a chance to redeem myself. How about if I ask you to close your eyes and point at the page 10 times? And that sounds better, I suppose. How, what could be more unbiased than closing your eyes? But they're pretty quick to point out that the bigger words still take up more room on the page. So you're still more likely to pick a big word than a small word, so that's still bias. We go back to the facial prototyping example, Bob and Tim. We follow that up by, by introducing strength of evidence. In a recent class, 36 out of 46 put Tim on the left. So we ask, what are two possible explanations for that? And that's a tough one. The explanation they're quick to give is, well, for whatever reason, people associate Tim with the face on the left. The explanation that's hard for them to think of is just random chance. Maybe they were all just essentially flipping a coin in their minds. Is that possible? Sure, but we can investigate that. How can we investigate that? I ask students to literally flip a coin. In this case, 46 times, see how many heads you get. See how often you get a result as extreme as 36 out of 46. Then we turn to technology and, and let an applet do the simulation. You can see in 10,000 simulated samples of 40, six students per sample, assuming a 50-50 process. We never got a result as extreme as I got in my class. So again, we've got very strong evidence. People tend to associate the name Tim with the face on the left. Recommendation six, this is the last one, but then I have two new emphases to, to talk about. Recommendation six, let's get back to the anchoring phenomenon. The recommendation is about using assessments, not just to evaluate, but to help students learn. So these are four questions I ask of almost every example we study in the whole course. Name the observational units. What are the variables? What kind of variable? Which one's explanatory? Which one's response? Did we make use of random sampling, random assignment, both, neither? Did an observational study is an experiment? I'm sure my students get sick of answering those questions. But I think it's important that every time you encounter a statistical study, you think about the answers to those questions. At the end, I, come up, I present these questions over and over again. Summarize your conclusion from the p-value. Estimate the magnitude of the effect with a confidence interval. Is it reasonable to draw a cause and effect conclusion? And to what population do you feel comfortable generalizing these results? Another example of an assessment question that I really like only partly because it deals with cats. I'm hoping to see some cats on your Zoom screens as we go through the day today. I got this question from a two-year college teacher nearby named Jay Lehman, who asked his students, which is larger, the mean weight of 10 people or the mean weight of 1,000 cats? And he said some of his students struggle because they don't think proportionally well. And they think 1,000 of something has got to be bigger than 10 of something. And I was pleased my students didn't struggle with this at all, so I was feeling all superior. But then I asked question B, and my students struggle mightily with question B. Which is larger, the standard deviation of the weights of 1,000 people or the standard deviation of the weights of 10 cats? And it's just like Abby and Mary from 20 slides ago. They should know the standard deviations of measure variability. People's weights vary a lot more than domestic cats' weights. So the answer should clearly be people. Lots and lots and lots of my students say cats. Why do they say that? I'm convinced it's because they think they heard me say that bigger sample sizes mean smaller standard deviations. 
I never said that. I talked about how a larger sample size means the standard deviation of a statistic, like a sample mean or a sample proportion, will be smaller. But what they heard, what they thought they learned, was a bigger sample size means a smaller standard deviation. Notice I'm careful to ask about standard deviation of the weights. But they're supposed to be focusing just on the weight. And I think this is a good question, partly for evaluating student learning and also for improving student learning. Interlude two, there's the three cats I've had in my, in my life. Eponine is on the left, Cosette in the top right. They're no longer with us, but Pudi is my current cat. Maybe Pudi will put in an appearance. Oops. So in 2016, the gays recommendations were revised. I was on the committee that revised them and we decided to keep the original six recommendations that we've talked about so far. We decided to add two new emphases. Under the heading of statistical thinking, we encourage teachers to help students understand that statistics is an investigative process of problem solving and decision making, and also to give students experience with multivariable thinking. I have one example for each of these. For the investigative process, Here's a question I like to ask my students, which they find very challenging. The first step of, of the process is to ask a question about the world. You can answer with data. So I say, let's suppose we go to the campus snack bar and collect data on these variables, whether the customer is a student or not, day of the week, the amount of the transaction, the waiting time. And I say things like, give me a research question where we could use a two sample t-test. Of course, that's near the end of the course when they've studied such a thing. Or give me a research question where we'd use a one sample t interval. And boy, students struggle with that more than I expected before I passed it. It's non-trivial to, to come up with research questions about the world. Second new emphasis is about multivariable thinking, which we already, the very first example in this presentation about Berkeley graduate admissions, that was multivariable thinking. We started out with sex and admission decision, but then we realized looking at program helped to explain what was going on. Well, we've got a similar example here with some numerical data. FEV is a measure of lung capacity. It stands for forced expiratory volume. We're looking at lung capacity measurements and also classifying people as smokers or non-smokers. And this is pretty weird. Again, the smokers have significantly higher average lung capacity and non-smokers. Is it really significant that well, the test statistic is bigger than seven? But what in the world is going on here? Well, there's an important piece of information I withhold from students until the next point of the example. The thing I withheld is information about the ages of these people. These aren't adults, these are kids. So kids from age three to 19. Does that matter? Well, sure, that matters. Because age is related both to whether someone's a smoker or not, and also to their lung capacity at this stage of their life. How are, how are age related? Well, in exactly the way you'd expect, because it's the older kids who tend to be smokers, and older kids tend to have bigger lungs than younger kids. If we put all that together and look at all three variables at once, maybe even throw on some regression lines for the two groups, the truth is actually what you probably would have expected. If you look at teenagers, we predict a higher lung capacity for the non-smokers than the smoker. And in fact, if you look at the slopes of the lines, the smokers have a much flatter line here. In other words, the rate of increase of lung capacity per year of aging as a kid is much more gradual for smokers, much deeper, much bigger for non-smokers. So that's an example of multivariable thinking. And the point here is not necessarily that STAT 101 needs to include multiple regression. The point is students need to think about relationships among variables, including more than just two variables at a time. Third and last interlude, I wanna describe my teaching philosophy. I've only got four minutes left. My teaching philosophy only has three words, so I think I'll be able to succeed. Legend has it that Frank Sinatra was once asked, what's the key to being a successful singer? According to legend, his answer was, sing good song. My answer to being an effective teacher is similarly succinct, and that is ask good questions. I mentioned I've been on leave for the past year. One of my, one of my main 
professional project on leave has been to write a blog. The blog is called Ask Good Questions. That's the address for the blog. Every Monday morning since last July, I've been posting a new blog post about teaching introductory statistics that revolves around this philosophy of asking good questions. So there's a, a shameless promotion for my blog. My goal for every post is to have something practical that teachers can use directly with their intro students. And also I try to be thought provoking to raise issues that would be beneficial to discuss with their peers. And I aim for a conversational style, perhaps once in a while, I even managed to, to make it fun. But the goal is to have 52 essays by the end of the year, which is coming up and, and we're getting close. Let me give you an example that I think illustrates five out of the six gaze recommendations, which you can find in one of the blog posts. Here's real data from the Youth Risky Behavior Surveillance Survey. I'm comparing Arizona and California kids the question is, how often do you wear a seatbelt when you're riding in a car driven by somebody else? And you can see Arizona kids are more likely to say they rarely or never wear a seatbelt as opposed to California kids. The question I put to students is, does this mean Arizona kids are 2.3% more likely to rarely or never wear a seatbelt than California kids? And most, most students, most people answer that question with yes, that's what that means, 0.081. Minus 0.058 is 0.023, it's 2.3%. But of course, that's not right. That's not how percentage change works. The difference is 2.3 percentage points. But that's not the same as percentage difference. How do we calculate percentage difference? Well, that's how we calculate percentage difference. It's actually about a 40% difference. Arizona kids are about 40% more likely to rarely or never wear a seatbelt compared to California. There's another way we could calculate that. Here's a backdoor way that's based on relative risk. If we just take the ratio of those proportions instead of the difference, we get 1.396. And students realize that, that we've seen that number before. It's a couple bullet points higher there. So a backdoor way to calculate percentage difference is through relative risk. My point is not that STAT 101 needs to teach relative risk. My point is, this is the kind of statistical reasoning or numerical literacy skill that we can help students to achieve. Here's where I'll try to be funny. I thought about naming this post what you see here, which has 60% words that start with P. Instead, I named it a pervasive pet P. So is that a 15% increase in the percent of P words? Well, no, that's the pet P, but it's actually a bigger increase. Let me conclude in my next minute here by saying there's a lot more to the Gaze Report than what I've tried to summarize here. One of the things that's in the Gaze Report is a list of nine goals for introductory students. There's five of them with four more to come on the next slide. And these slides will be available. I've emailed them to, to Mina and she'll put them somewhere. You can get them if you're interested. Also, the Gaze Report includes lots and lots of appendices with lots and lots of information and examples. There's a list of the appendices of the, of the Gaze Report, each of which has lots of I hope, worthwhile examples and, and discussion. So I think I managed to finish on time. I'm sorry that I, that I talked so quickly and that I rolled through this like I did without any uh, feedback from you. But now we have time for a 15 minute breakout session. And the theme question to, to generate discussion in the breakout session is how do you already incorporate gaze recommendations in your teaching? Or how do you think you will in the future incorporate gaze recommendations in your teaching?